έτσι ο θεϊκός εκεί, πολύπαθος ευχόταν ο Οδυσσέας. Την κόρη ωστόσο οι μούλες γρήγορα, κατά το κάστρο έσερναν κι αυτήν. Σαν έφτασε στου κύρι τη τα ξακουστά παλάτια. Μπρο στην αυλόπορτα σταμάτησε και γύρα τη σταθήκαν όμοι με αθάνατου στα αδέρφια τη. Και κάτω από το αμάξι τι μούλε λύσαν και κουβάλισαν τα ρούχα με στο σπίτι. Πώ ομεν ένθα έρα το πολλούτλα δύο οδύσιο. Κουρέν δε πρώτη άστου φερέν μενός χειμιονόιον. Πέδ χότε δε που πάτρος αγκα κλούτα δόμα τα χήκανε. Στέσεν αρ εν προθυρόησι. Κασιγνέτοι δε μην άμφις χίσταντ αθανατοίς εν αλήγκιοι. Πορ χούπα πένες χειμιονούς έλιον. Εσπέτα τε έσπερον έσω. So he prayed there, the much enduring goodly Odysseus, while the two strong mules bore the maiden to the city. But when she had come to the glorious palace of her father, she halted the mules at the outer gate and her brothers thronged about her godlike men and loosed the mules from the wagon and bore the raiment within. And she herself went to her chamber. There a fire was kindled for her by her waiting woman, Yuri Medusa, an aged dame from Apire. Long ago, the curved ships had brought her from Apire, and men had chosen her from the spoil as a gift of honor for Alcinous, for that he was king over all the Phaeacians, and the people hearkened to him as to a god. She it was who had reared the white armed Nausicaa in the palace, and she it was who kindled the fire for her and made her ready her supper in the chamber. Then Odysseus roused himself to go to the city, and Athena, with kindly purpose, cast about him a thick mist, so that no one of the great-hearted Phaeacians meeting him should speak mockingly to him and ask him who he was. But when he was about to enter the lovely city, then the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, met him in the guise of a young maiden carrying a pitcher. And she stood before him, and goodly Odysseus questioned her, saying, my child, could you guide me to the house of him they call Alcinous, who is lord among the people here? I'm a stranger here, worn out and exhausted from a distant country. I know no one here in this city and country. Then the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, answered him, Well, stranger, I will show you the palace as you ask. My noble father's house is right next door to it. I will lead the way, but you must be careful as we go. Don't look at anyone, nor question them. For men here don't take kindly to strangers, especially foreigners. Although they have, themselves, no second thoughts of using their own fast ships to fly across the sea to foreign lands. So speaking, Pallas Athena led the way quickly, and he followed in the footsteps of the goddess. And as he went through the city in the midst of them, the Phaeacians, famed for their ships, took no heed of him, for fair tressed Athena, the dread goddess, would not suffer it, but shed about him a wondrous mist, for her heart was kind towards him. And Odysseus marveled at the harbours and the stately ships, at the meeting places where the heroes themselves gathered, and the walls, long and high and crowned with palisades, a wonder to behold. But when they had come to the glorious palace of the king, the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, was the first to speak, saying, Here, sir stranger, is the palace you asked me to show you, and you will find the kings, fostered by Zeus, feasting at a banquet. Go in, and do not be afraid. Be bold, for a man with courage is better in all things, even if he is a foreigner. Go to the queen first. Arete is the name by which she is called, born from the same line as the king Alcinous. His father, now Sithus, was born from the earth shake of Poseidon and the beautiful Periboea. Their other son, Rexenor, had one child, a daughter, Arete. Arcanus made her his wife and honoured her as no other woman on earth is honoured, and by her children and by the people who look upon her as a goddess. She herself is not lacking in wisdom and empathy, and if you win her favour, 
then there is hope that you will see your friends and return to your high-roofed house and your native land. So saying, flashing-eyed Athena departed over the unresting sea until she came to Marathon and the broad streets of Athens and entered the well-built house of Erechtheus. Meanwhile, as Odysseus approached the glorious house of Alcinous, such feeling stirred within him that he stopped at the threshold of bronze, for there was a gleam as of sun or moon on the high walls, of bronze where the walls that stretched this way and that from the threshold to the innermost chamber, and around was a cornice in blue. Golden were the doors of that well-built house, and doorsteps of silver were set in a threshold of bronze. Of silver was the lintel above, and of gold the handle. On either side of the door there stood gold and silver dogs, which Hephaestus had fashioned with cunning skill to guard the palace of great-hearted Alcinous. Immortal were they, and ageless all their days. Within, seats were fixed along the wall on either hand, from the threshold to the innermost chamber, and on them were thrown robes of soft fabric, cunningly woven, the handiwork of women. On these, the leaders of the Phaeacians were wont to sit drinking and eating, for they had unfailing store. And golden youth stood on well-built pedestals, holding lighted torches in their hands to give light by night to the banqueteers in the hall. And fifty slave women he had in the house, of whom some grind the yellow grain on the millstone, and others weave webs, or, as they sit, twirl the yarn like unto the leaves of a tall poplar tree. And from the closely woven linen, the soft olive oil drips down. For as the Phaeacian men are skilled above all others in speeding a swift ship upon the sea, so are the women cunning workers at the loom. For Athena has given to them above all others skill in fair handiwork and an understanding heart. Outside the courtyard is a great orchard of four acres hedged on all sides. Therein grow trees, tall and luxuriant, pears and pomegranates and apple trees with their bright fruit and sweet figs and luxuriant olives. Of these, the fruit perishes not, nor fails in winter or in summer, but lasts throughout the year and ever does the west wind as it blows, quicken to life some fruits, and ripen others, pair upon it, pair waxes, one part of which a warm spot on level ground is being dried in the sun, while other grapes men are gathering, and others too there are treading, but in front are unripe grapes that are shedding the blossom, and others that are turning purple. There again, by the last row of the vines, grow trim garden beds of every sort blooming the year through, and therein are two springs, one of which sends its water throughout all the garden, while the other, over against it, flows beneath the threshold of the court towards the high house. And from this the townsfolk drew their water. Such were the glorious gifts of the gods in the palace of Alcinous. There the much-enduring goodly Odysseus stood and gazed, but when he had marveled in his heart at all things, he passed quickly over the threshold into the house. There he found the leaders and counsellors of the Phaeacians pouring libations from their cups to the keen-sighted Hermes, to whom the last wine would be poured before they went to their beds. But the much-enduring, goodly Odysseus went through the hall, wrapped in the thick mist which Athena had shed about him, till he came to Areti, and to Alcinous the king. About the knees of Arete, Odysseus cast his hands, and straightway the wondrous mist melted from him, and a hush fell upon all that were in the room at the sight of the man, and they marveled as they looked upon him. But Odysseus made his prayer. Arete, daughter of godlike Rexenor, to your husband and to your knees am I come after endless toils. To you and to these your guests, may the gods grant happiness in life. May each of them hand down to his children the wealth in his halls, and the dues of honour which the people have given him. But for me, 
I ask that you may help me come to my native land and quickly. For I've been suffering such misery far from my friends. So saying, he sat down on the hearth in the ashes by the fire, and they were all hushed in silence. But at length there spoke among them the old lord Echenius, who was an elder among the Phaeacians, well skilled in speech and understanding all the wisdom of old. He, with good intent, addressed the assembly and said, Alcanoas, this is not right. It's not seemly that a stranger should sit on the ground, on your hearth and in the ashes, and your people wanting to do something but waiting for your word. Come, let the stranger rise and set him on a silver-studded chair and bid the servants mix wine so that we may pour libations also to Zeus, Lord of Thunder. For he always attends suppliants who are owed reverence. And let the housekeeper give supper to the stranger from our own supplies. When the strong and mighty Alcinous heard this, he took by the hand Odysseus, the wise and crafty-minded, and raised him from the hearth and sat him upon a bright chair from which he bade his son, the kindly Laodamas, to rise, for he sat next to him and was his best beloved. Then a handmaid brought water for the hands in a fair pitcher of gold and poured it over a silver basin for him to wash, and beside him drew up a polished table. And the grave housekeeper brought and set before him bread and dainties in abundance, giving freely of her store. So the much enduring goodly Odysseus drank and ate. And then the mighty Alcinous spoke to the herald and said, Antonius, mix the bowl and serve wine to all in the hall, that we may pour libations also to Zeus, who hurls the thunderbolt. He spoke, and Pontonous mixed the honey-hearted wine and served out to all, pouring first drops for libation into the cups. But when they had poured libations and had drunk to their heart's content, Alcinous addressed the assembly and spoke among them. Leaders and counsellors of the Phaeacians, listen to what my heart is telling me. Now we have finished our feast, Go, each of you, to your house to rest. But in the morning, we will entertain the stranger in our halls and offer goodly sacrifices to the gods. After that, we will give thought to his return, so that he may come with speed to his native land and joyfully. Nor shall he suffer any evil or harm until he sets foot upon his own land and suffers whatever fate and the dread spinners spun with their thread for him at his birth. But if he is one of the immortals come down from heaven, then this is some new thing which the gods are planning. For never have they appeared to us without us sacrificing glorious offerings to them, and they feast among us, sitting even where we sit. And if one of us as a lone traveller meets them, they do not hide from us, for we are nearly kin to them, as are the Cyclopes and the wild tribes of the giants. Then Odysseus answered him and said, Alcinous, I am not like the immortals, either in stature or in form, but like all mortal men. Whoever you know among men who bear the greatest burden of sadness, to them might I liken myself. And I could tell a yet longer tale of all the evils which I've endured by the will of the gods. Allow me now to eat, despite my grief. For there is nothing more shameless than a hateful belly, which no matter what kind of suffering a man may know, it needs make men forget all they have suffered, as mine does now, commanding me to eat my fill. But at the break of day, why, set me swiftly on the soil of my native land, and let life leave me, when I have seen once more my possessions, my slaves, and my great high-roofed house. So he spoke, and they all praised his words and agreed to help the stranger on his way, since he had spoken fittingly. Then when they had poured libations and had drunk to their heart's content, they went each man to his home to take their rest, and goodly Odysseus was left behind in the hall, and beside him sat Arete and godlike Alcinous, 
and white-armed Areti was the first to speak, for she had recognized his clothing, the mantle and tunic, which she herself had fashioned with her handmaids. She spoke and addressed him with winged words. Stranger, let me ask you first, who are you among men and from where? Who gave you these clothes? Did you not say that you came here after wandering across the sea? Then Odysseus answered her and said, It is too hard, O queen, to tell the whole story of my woes, since the heavenly gods have given me many. But this will I tell you. There is an isle, Ogugia, which lies far off in the sea. There lives the fair-haired daughter of Atlas, guileful Calypso, a fearful goddess. Neither gods or mortals will have anything to do with her. But fate brought me in my wretchedness to her home. The Zeus, with his bright thunderbolt, had shattered my ship in the middle of the wine-dark sea. There all the rest of my trusty comrades perished, but I clasped in my arms the keel of my curved ship and was born drifting for nine days. And on the tenth black night, the gods brought me to that isle where the dread goddess Calypso lives. She took me to her home with kindly welcome and gave me food and said that she would make me immortal and ageless all my days. But she could never persuade this heart of mine. For seven years I remained there, and every day my tears would wet the immortal clothes which Calypso gave me. But when the eighth year came around, she told me to go, either because of some message from Zeus or because her own mind was turned. She sent me on my way on a raft, stoutly bound, and gave me abundant store of bread and wine, gave me immortal clothes, and sent forth a gentle wind. So for 17 days I sailed over the sea. And on the 18th appeared the shadowy mountains of your land. And my heart was glad, for I was yet to know the great sorrow which beside me had sent me. For he stirred up the winds and aroused the sea against me. Indeed, the storm shattered my raft. But by swimming, I made my way until the wind and the waves brought me to your shores. There, had I sought to land, the waves would have dashed me against the great crags and rocks. But I swam back until I came to a river, where it seemed to me the best place. It was shelter from the wind. I staggered out, gasping for breath, and a mortal night came on. Then I went and lay down to sleep in the bushes, gathering leaves about me, and a god shed over me infinite sleep. So there among the leaves I slept, my heart in despair, the whole night through, past the morning, past midday, and the sun turned to his setting before sweet sleep released me. Then I saw the handmaids of your daughter on the shore at play, and she was with them, fair as the goddesses. I made my pleas to her, and she was wise beyond her years in understanding, not as you would expect from one so young, for younger folk are often thoughtless. She gave bread and sparkling wine, and bathed me in the river, and gave me these to wear. All that I have told you is the truth. Then in turn, Alcinous answered him and said, Stranger, my daughter did not do right in this, because she did not bring you first to our house. Yet it was to her you made your pleas. Then Odysseus of many wiles answered him and said, Prince, do not rebuke your blameless daughter. She did indeed ask me to follow with her maidens here, but I would, fo but I would not for fear and shame that you might not take kindly to her aiding me, for you are quick to anger, we tribes of men. And again Alcinous answered him and said, Stranger, my heart is not the kind to be filled with wrath without a cause. Better is due measure in all things. I would, her father Zeus, that you, so good a man and like-minded with me, would have my daughter as wife and be called my son and live here. But no one of the Phaeacians will keep you against your will. But... As for leaving, it is assured, and you shall lie down, overcome by sleep, as you are rowed over the calm sea, until you come to your country and house, or to whatever place you wish, even though it be beyond Euboea, which those of our people who saw it say is the furthest of lands. There they went and without much effort accomplished their journey, and on the selfsame day came back home. So shall you know how far my ships are the best, and my youths in tossing the brine with the oar blade. So he said, 
and the much enduring goodly Odysseus was glad, and he spoke in prayer and said, Father's use, grant that Alcanus may bring to pass all that he has said, so shall his fame be unquenchable over the earth, the giver of grain, and I shall reach my native land. Thus they spoke to one another, and white-armed Areti bade her maidens place a bedspread under cover of the portico, and to lay on it fair blankets of purple, and to spread there over coverlets, and on these to put fleecy cloaks for clothing. So they went forth from the hall with torches in their hands. But when they had busily spread the stout-built bedstead, they came to Odysseus and called to him and said, Rouse yourself, stranger, to go to your rest. Your bed is made. So they spoke, and he welcomed the opportunity to lay down and sleep. So there he slept, the much-enduring goodly Odysseus, on the corded bedstead under the echoing portico. But Alcinous lay down in the innermost chamber of the lofty house, and beside him lay the lady Arete, his wife. Os fan, toi das bastone sato con methenai. Os homen ent da capelde polut las dios odiseus. Cretois en leke sin hup aithuse eridupoi. Alcinous dara lecto, mucoi domu hupseloio. Par de gune despoina lecos, porsune kai eunen. Afta ipan, ki odisea sto harike, pu irse ora na plagiasi. Eci ki motan o polipathos, isotheos odiseas. Se clini tripiti, sto aholano, to skepasto apocato. Κι ο Αλκίνος στο αψιλού εκοιμήθηκε του παλατιού το βάθος, εκεί που του στρωνε το τέρι του και πλάγιαζε μαζί του. <Τι>